Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker Saturday. November 22nd, 1963. Many call it the day that America changed forever. As we observe the 60th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, a wide majority of Americans still believe President Kennedy was murdered as part of some conspiracy that Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone on that day. That conclusion has become something of an article of faith in America, but few who hold that view have actually poured over the evidence in the case. Gerald Posner has. In 1993, he wrote perhaps a definitive book on the case, and the title alone is a declarative line in the sand. Case closed. Lee Harvey Oswald and the assassination of JFK. Gerald Posner joins me now uh, on Newsmaker Saturday. It's great to see you. Great to be with you, John. A real pleasure. Let me read one quick. This is out of the New York Times. Um, it says that Posner argues with awesome command of evidentiary detail that Oswald did it, period. They don't leave any ambiguity. And you stick by that even 30 years later with the conclusion you came to, you're comfortable with it. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm more convinced than, than ever in the sense that since the, the book was published, in the intervening 30 years, People who thought it was a conspiracy, they've been waiting for the deathbed confession of one of the conspirators somewhere. You know, that's never come. Uh, they've been waiting for some document to be released from the National Archives that would be the smoking gun that would blow the case open. That's never happened. So, and more science and ballistics experts have come forward with new tests to determine whether the shooting sequence at Dealey Plaza, how it happened. It's all confirmed the way that Warren Commission sort of guessed it did and now we know that's the way it happened in terms of science. So the last 30 years, all that's happened is more information that's been released sort of confirmed my original feeling. It's just Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone. And that's it. And it's tough for people to believe that, I think Dan Rather called him a pipsqueak at one point and said it's just hard for Americans to believe that this meek pipsqueak could take out a president. But of course it has happened throughout history. We've had people um, taken out. And it is, sometimes it's a confluence of luck, if you want to put it that way, timing. But, uh, Gerald, I have always thought, as a journalist, this is really a basic homicide case. But because it's a president, it has taken on this warped, insane, conspiratorial air to it. You're absolutely right. And because it's, it, because it's the Kennedys as well, because there are, and there are things, John, that lend to why it's taken on this air. I mean, we had a, an assassin, the first time in modern American history, it's only happened one other time in the King assassination, who fired from a high-powered rifle from a distance. So some people immediately think, oh, that's like a professional assassin. The assassin gets away in the immediate aftermath, so it doesn't get caught immediately. A couple of hours later, it does, and then gets killed two days later by a fellow who you know has all the appearance of a tough guy mobster. So all of that mixed together on top of the Kennedys, on top of the fact that it's a 24 year old loser sociopath in life. No wonder people thought there was something more to this. The ballistics to me are the linchpin. There is not a single ordinate bullet or fragment recovered from Dealey Plaza, the limousine, the president, John Conley, that did not come from Lee Harvey Oswald's gun. The, you know this so well because you've done investigations and you've done a book. You, you know how cases are built and what cold cases, how they are solved. And you're right that in the end, this is a murder case. That's exactly what it is. The, and the ballistics show that there was only one shooter at Didi Plaza who hit anybody that day. That shooter was firing from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of every other gun in the world, firing from behind the president in the very same location in terms of where they have to be placed, where Lee Harvey Oswald was left just 30 minutes before he kills the president by his co-workers. That question coming out of Didi Plaza, you're right, the ballistics are there. You know as an investigator, if you were putting in this person on trial, that Oswald is the trigger man. Now the question is, did he do it for himself or did he do it for part of another group? And that's the more difficult part always in the end, I conclude he did it for his own warped motivations, but that's the difficult one to investigate. 
That is, that is an interesting question because if you were going to hire someone to take out the president, Lee Harvey Oswald would probably be the last guy you'd get. His biography is so bizarre, defecting to Russia during the height of tensions between the two countries, trying to kill himself in Minsk when everything goes south and he, he's disillusioned with Russia. Then he comes back to the U.S. and he's got an ax to grind apparently because of our relations with Cuba. But you would not hire a guy with a $12 rifle uh, who's a good shot but not a great shot and who's got all of these kind of personality quirks and is really unstable. He's the last guy you'd hire to do this. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And people don't often realize that. I mean, Oswald's instability, uh, the reason that he's, I was the first journalist to interview a Russian defector uh, called Yuri Nosenko. It turned out he'd been hiding in the United States after his defection here under an alias. He finally came public around the time I was doing my research. And he said, look, we, we thought he was unstable. We gave him a psychiatric exam and thought he was unstable. Oswald had a psychiatric exam when he was 13 years old, very rare for a person later accused of killing the president of the United States to have been examined by a psychiatrist when he was 13 because he had school issues. And that psychiatrist remembered him years later before the Warren Commission because he showed this schizoid personality, aggressive personality disorder that could act out in violence. So Oswald is not the type of person that the mob, the CIA, a group of anti-Castro Cubans would say, you know, we're looking for a hired assassin who will be able to keep their mouth shut and pull this off. We think it's you with your World War II military rifle and your background. You'll be the perfect person. He'd be the last person they would go yeah. to. Gerald, I'm sure it's happened to you. You're on an airplane or you're at a cocktail party and somebody spouts off, well, Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy, Oswald was a patsy, or this or that. Thumbnail how you respond when somebody tells you that. You know, I'm stubborn if nothing else. So I <laughs> still will try to reason with them. Yeah. My wife, Tricia, who works with me um, and has lived with Lee Harvey Oswald more years than she would like to have lived with him, will roll her eyes and say, come on, we've got to get going. We've got to get going. And meanwhile, I'm in the middle of trying to explain why the single bullet mm -hmm. happened or that, because I think that there's a way to, to talk the facts, rational thinking, using a little bit of logic. 99% of the time, I'm wrong, uh, because you can't get people who believe it's a wide government conspiracy to accept sometimes even the simplest things and they also believe things that they've heard over the years so many times that they accept them as facts, even though they are demonstrably false. So they believe that there was a front shooter on the grassy knoll. Yes. That Kennedy was shot from the front, even though that's been long debunked by the forensics. Uh, they think that somehow there were a hundred people or more who were killed immediately after the assassination because they knew something in a trail of mystery deaths. Those have all been individually debunked. But if somebody doesn't know that, you can't get them off the first base in terms of the decision. One of the other things that I think is so compelling is that there were actually people who saw a man in the sixth floor window of the depository with a rifle. One of them, I believe, is Howard Brennan. He was 93 feet away. He's a construction worker. He eyeballed this and actually saw him firing the shots. I mean, that he is compelling in any other case. That is so compelling. And not only that, you point out in your book, 88% of the eyewitnesses said three shots, no doubt. Three shots, that's it. The, but you know, I, I agree. So the eyewitnesses, the ear witnesses are fantastic in terms of being able to say only three shots and most of them say coming from behind. But I also know as an investigator that we can't rely on ear witnesses and eyewitnesses to tell us there's better evidence. The Zapruder film tells us how many shots in a very unusual way, which people don't often look at, which is the Zapruder himself, this Dallas dressmaker who's trying out his eight millimeter camera that day and happens to capture the assassination. Every time a shot is fired, he his hand jiggles just yes. a little bit. He's holding the camera. And afterwards, the FBI and CBS recreated this. They had people holding a camera equivalent of his, Bell and Howell. They would fire a shot. They told them the shots would be fired. No matter how much they tried not to do it, the camera moves a little bit. You can see those movements, those three shots take place. We see the men, Kennedy and the governor, and then Kennedy on the death shot, reacting to when the bullets hit twice. So that film is very, very compelling. It tells you where the shots are coming from and the number of them. 
because I'm always reluctant. You know, people will use eyewitness testimony and ear witness testimony and say, this is definitive. I think it's persuasive. But as, as a former lawyer and as a journalist, I say, what's the best evidence? There's even better evidence. And then, of course, the best evidence are the x-rays and the photos from the autopsy. They show you the wounds and exactly where he was hit from. There's no doubt. The shaking of the camera and the reaction of people on the ground in the Zapruder film, the timeline of when the shots were fired has dramatically changed. Maybe not dramatically, but by a few seconds to where the first shot actually missed. And we don't right. know quite whether it hit a light pole, which was down there on Elm Street, and ricocheted. It hit a guy down the street, James Tagg. It hit him on the chin, a piece of concrete. So that was shot number one. It missed the limousine entirely, missed its target. Or it hit uh, the, the tree that was blocking Oswald's right. view. That sets the timeline that he's not having to fire shots quickly. This gives him about eight seconds, doesn't it, to get off and two I, shots? Yeah. About eight and a half to nine seconds, the Warren Commission had given him five and a half seconds because they thought the first shot hit. So they were looking at it that way. As a matter of fact, one of the most famous conspiracy books written in the 60s on the case was called Six Seconds in Dallas. Yes. Great title to a book, but it'll give you an idea of what they thought the time sequence was. And even though CBS and, and the FBI and two different reconstructions had experts go up and shoot at a moving target and they were able to pull off the assassination and they five and a half seconds. It's a tough shooting sequence. Now, when you realize that the first shot missed, the only thing we know about that for sure, as you said, is it hit a curbstone 500 feet out from the depository and wounded a bystander. What is interesting is the first bullet is in the chamber. So that starts the clock running. So Oswald pulls the first bullet, fires it. The clock is now going three and a half seconds, about three and a half to almost four seconds after that shot, he recocks the gun, aims again, fires. That's the so-called single bullet, what Oliver Stone would call the magic bullet yes. that hits Kennedy and goes on to wound the governor. We know that exactly on the film where it happens. You see the men reacting to it. And then, John, he has a full five seconds from that shot to the fatal headshot. And the car has slowed. The limousine has slowed. The driver of the limousine is the oldest member of the security detail. He turns around. And he's looking at the president at the moment of the headshot. So it's moved, goes down from about 10 miles an hour to about five. Wow. Kennedy in the back brace, his head lulled a little bit to the left from that wound on the, the other previous shot. Oswald gets the straight on shot. It looks like it's 25 yards away in his four power scope. And he still almost misses. It hits Kennedy on the high right rear portion of the head. An inch and a half higher, it's, and he misses and Kennedy lives. We know now from... Hinckley and Ronald Reagan an inch over and Reagan would have been dead. That's what you mentioned in the very beginning when we started to talk. People hate the word luck when you're talking about an assassination. Yes. There's a bit of things that have to break just right for the assassin, and it did for Oswald. I, something that has vexed me, do you believe that Oswald, through his scope, knew he had landed a fatal shot to the president? Would he have seen that clearly in his scope? You know, the I, you would have to imagine there are some people, by the way, some shooters that think that Oswald didn't even use the scope. He used the iron uh, sighting that, that might have been cleaner for him. So he can't be 100 percent sure if he was using the iron sights. No question. He would have seen it. If he was using the scope as he pulls that gun away from him. It's hard to imagine that he doesn't know he's got the shot because there's something that happens at that moment that indicates the chaos around it, which is the first lady starts to climb out the back of the car. Yes. All he has to do is look, we're talking about a second and a half to two seconds afterwards. The first lady starts Jackie to come over the back and only realizes what's happening when she's almost gently pushed back into the seat by Clint Hill, the Secret Service agent who's jumping out of the back of the car. So Oswald knows he's wrecked havoc. He may have no idea that it's that deadly a shot. And I have to say that for Oswald, he is just 24 years old. He had tried to kill an army general a few months earlier with a single shot. He misses because the bullet grazes along a window. Edwin pane. Walker. Edwin Walker, and he misses him. The thing is, the no matter how much he's thought about shooting at the president, he, he's never seen a presidential motorcade. And when that motorcade comes around the corner off of Main Street and starts to go to the depository where he's working, it comes in in technicolor. You've got the president, you've got Jackie in her pink Chanel suit, you've got the governor low with his Stetson hat and the Secret Service are all around. They're standing in the back of the car. He has to be nervous. The adrenaline is pumping. And then when it comes around that he's ready to take his shots as the car pulls away down the distance, 
He misses on the first shot, which has to set a bit of a panic in. Nobody reacts. The second shot, he knows he's hit. He sees the reaction, but now he has to stay with it. He has to hold his calm, his nerves. He can't start shaking. He can't run from that window. Another five seconds, people could be looking up as Brennan was, the construction worker, and sees him shooting. He's got to be worried about being outed, but he stays calm for that. And I think that's, I don't say this in admiration of him. I think how many times I wish he failed, how many times I wish that his nerves were so great he couldn't pull it off, that the, the rifle would shake so much. Somehow he was able to stay with it and carry that out, uh, which is a remarkable feat considering the, the, what was at stake and the nerves that must have been going through him. We are back with Gerald Posner in a moment. Back with Gerald Posner, author of Case Closed. The first shot that hit the limousine, which was shot number two, so the so-called magic bullet, hits Kennedy through the back, exits his throat, his tie knot, roughly, hits Conley, Governor Conley, who's sitting in a jump seat a little off, about six inches off to his left. Was that, that was survivable for the president, right? If that had been it, he, it would have been damage. He would have been speaking differently probably after this but it would have been survivable. No question. Uh, I talked to the doctors who treated him at uh, Parkland, a, um, all the main treating physicians I interviewed again in 1992. I was very lucky to get to all of them. And they said that, you know, that they didn't trach that wound out. They, they had a tracheotomy in him, but they said that they were convinced afterwards from looking at the, they would have been able to save him when they see what the autopsy had shown in terms of x-rays and, and photographs. So that was a survivable shot. The, the headshot was about as deadly as you could get. Yeah. The president lost about a third of brain matter, and, and the, it's, there's no other way to describe it. It was a horrific shot. By the time the president arrives at Parkland, he is essentially dead, but they made a heroic effort to try to resuscitate him, but there was no chance. Let's talk about the Zapruder film for a minute, because there's all this discussion about a shooter in front. When they see the head recoil backwards and to the, to the right, people say, well, that, that looks like he's been shot from the front. But if you look at Zapruder film, frames 312, 313, it tells the story. But you need to see those frames completely slowed down to see what actually happens. What happens? Hey, you know, it, it's very important what you mentioned, because when I first saw the Zapruder film in 1975, I just started law school. I remember when it was shown for the first time. I watched it and thought, oh. It looks like the president shot from the front. The reaction many people had, because we've seen enough Westerns. We know what happens in them. Somebody gets shot, and then, then they keel over in the opposite direction from where the bullet lands. So you see it in regular full time, 18 frames a second. It looks like the president must be hit from the front because his head goes back so violently into the left, the, which Oliver Stone drives home in his, uh, of course, time and time again in that, in that film. What happens when you slow it up, you digitize it, you can make a copy of that film today that wasn't available to the Warren Commission. You look at it frame by frame, an 18th of a second earlier, because the, the, it moves at 18 frames a second, 18th of a second earlier at frame 312, the bullet strikes, and Kennedy's back measured from the seat, the rear of the seat, to his, the back of where his suit jacket is moves forward in about two inches. There's this violent move forward in literally a fraction of a second. That's the bullet hitting. The next frame in 18th of a second, it explodes out the right side of his head. And you can see it on the film. It takes place in this sort of mist cloud of, and this is graphic, no other way to describe it, blood and brain tissue. It moves out into this uh, sort of area to the right of him. For a long time, John, two motorcycle policemen behind him, especially on the one on the right side of the car, they were splattered with blood and people thought, well, that must mean he's hit again from the front because Kennedy shot, the wound goes out the back and it sprays the two motorcycle policemen. On the Zapruder film, as you go frame by frame on the, a digital version, you can see those officers drive right into the mist. It's a terrible thing. Oh, they get yeah. splattered with the blood as they yeah. go into that cloud that just exploded out the front of the president's head. It, it is so horrific, and when Geraldo Rivera showed it, I remember, I, as a kid, I watched it happen when he ran it on Goodnight America. I could not believe what I was seeing because I'd only read about it and seen stills in Life magazine. Okay, 
Oswald's, we've only got a few minutes left, Oswald's movements after the assassination. Again, these are all hallmarks of a guilty man. He gets out of there, he has no plan, apparently, he is scrambling. He gets on a bus, he gets off a bus, he ends up back at his rooming house, he grabs a gun, a windbreaker, he ends up shooting Officer Tippett. I've interviewed Officer Tippett's widow. She's a very delightful woman who I think just passed. Um, these are not the, the actions of, a, of an innocent guy who's just been set up. Right. You, you're absolutely right. Look, I say to people all the time, people say, oh, I think he's a patsy. And I say, look, if he was a patsy, you don't have to kill him. You don't have to do anything. A patsy is somebody who's been set up. All the evidence is there and they're going to get convicted of a crime they don't know anything about and go to prison. And that's the end of them. They're going to be Oswald would be sitting at Didi Plaza asking questions about what happened to the president when the police came to arrest him. Instead, all of his actions after the assassination are what you said, a flight. So even if people want to think all he did was bring in the assassination rifle and there was some world class assassin up there who then shot the president, Oswald was involved. He's involved in the plot. I think he's the shooter to the exclusion of anybody else. And when he does leave the depository, he's the only one of the employees who leaves the scene. He does get in a taxi, which may not mean anything at first to people watching this uh, show. But to Oswald, that was important. He'd never taken one in his life because he didn't have much money, but he wanted to get away fast. The traffic was terrible, so he left it to get on a bus. Goes back to his rooming house for what reason? To change the top on his clothes, but also to get his pistol. And then he has the bad luck of being stopped by a Dallas policeman. It wasn't the only person stopped that day. Harold Brennan, the, the person who had given the eyewitness account of yes. the shooter he saw, mid-20s, brown hair, Caucasian. That was a general all-points bulletin put out. Three or four Dallas policemen stopped people that day walking around who looked a little suspicious and fit that generic, uh, you know, all-points. For whatever reason, Tippett, when he stopped Oswald, did not think he was the suspect because the protocol was he should have called in to police headquarters on his radio to say, I think I may have the suspect. He didn't do that. He should take his pistol out if he thinks he has a suspect. He didn't do that. But something about Oswald seemed odd as he was walking fast through the neighborhood. So Tippett gets out, and as he gets out of the car, Oswald whips out his pistol, unloads on him in front of a dozen witnesses. And whatever Oswald was going to do, John, to get away, and we don't know because he took that to the grave with him, uh, some people speculate that he had $14 on him enough to get on a bus that was a half a mile away that would have arrived in 45 minutes to take him back to Laredo, Texas, and then on the way to Mexico City and to try to get to Cuba once again. Possible, but we'll never know. But killing Tippett then throws everything off. And from that point on, he's just trying to stay away from the police and doesn't do it for very long. I know we've only got you for a little bit of time left. I have to ask you about Jack Ruby because that is probably the single thing that threw everyone in a tizzy. It looked like a absolute rub out that somebody was trying to silence Oswald. Any even rational person would go, wait a minute, now the shooter of the president's been assassinated? You're kidding me. You can see how this grows, but Ruby seems to be another one where time and fate, and I hate to say luck, all collide. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And the thing is, look, Ruby's robbed us of real answers in the case. He robbed us of the chance of putting Oswald on trial. And even if Oswald continued to protest his innocence years later, there would be some people who would listen to him, just as there were with the, you know, James Earl Ray, who sat for decades in prison and said, I was really, you know, not the assassin. Some people listened to him, but a lot of people dismissed it. With Oswald, because he was killed, Ruby really set the conspiracies off. And Ruby, unfortunately, cannot be summarized in a soundbite. I think yeah. you got pretty darn close to the truth, even though it can sometimes be elusive and clouded and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, I think there is a, a truth to be had in this case. But if you do what you know so well, you look for the evidence. What's the best evidence? What does the forensic show? Let's get the ballistics. Let's find out about motive. You put it all together. You can come to an answer for history on this case. And it's not a sensational one. It's the simple one, unfortunately, that one young man armed with a rifle can change the course of history and Oswald in fact did that. Gerald Posner, author of Case Closed, a definitive book on the Kennedy assassination. Gerald, thank you so much for spending some time with us today on Newsmaker Saturday. In the end, all we have is evidence and that's what we've tried to explore here with Gerald Posner. Thanks to him for his time. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday.